It's a pleasure to have you here for this webinar, Brain Health in the Mediterranean Diet. And we're so pleased to be able to offer this, thanks to our friends at the PINA Institute for sponsoring this session. Um, just a brief introduction here. For those of you who aren't familiar with Old Ways, we're a nonprofit nutrition education organization, best known for creating the Mediterranean Diet Pyramid in partnership with the Harvard School of Public Health and also for creating the whole grain stamp, um, which you may see on food packages. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Um, yes, we are recording this session, and so you will all have access to the recording and the slides. We'll post them on our website, oldwayspt.org cpeu, um, and we'll also email you the recording and the slides within one week. And um, for those of you registered dietitians seeking CPEU credit, um, we'll also send you the certificates as well. So stay tuned on your email this week. Um, we should have a little bit of time at the end to take some question and answer. Um, so you can submit your questions. There's a Q&A function on Zoom. Um, so feel free to type those in as soon as you think of anything. Um, and we'll also be managing the chat as well. And yes, thank you again to the PINA Institute. Now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Samara Sterling, uh, who will be leading this session today. All right, thank you, Kelly, and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you all for joining us for this exciting webinar where we, we will be talking about brain health and the Mediterranean diet. And uh, just so you know, we do have, as Kelly mentioned, continuing education credits uh, for this webinar. And these are the performance indicators that we are working with today. And I wanna start with a question that I'd like us to sort of think about. about. Many of us are, are nutritionists, dietitians, other health professionals. And so we have interacted with health on a variety of levels in our day-to-day -day experiences. But what exactly is health? What is the definition of health? And I've got three choices here. I'm not saying that they're perfect, but I'd like to hear what you think about that. Is health the state of being free from illness or injury? Or would you say health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well being? Or would you say health is a process of preserving balance within a person's social and physical environment? And I'd like to launch a poll and kind of get your ideas of what you think health is. It's interesting because we don't normally think about this definition, do we? And I'm not sure that any of these definitions is perfect, but I'm interested in hearing what you may have to say about this. So I'll give a couple more seconds here, maybe five seconds or so, and get your answers in on that poll, and then we'll kind of have a look at what everyone says. All right, we can take a look at that poll now. Okay. Okay, interesting, and I'm not surprised. So 65% of us said that health, the closest definition to health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. That doesn't surprise me, especially as we are in the middle of this pandemic right now, where many of us are not able to be as social as we would like to be. And then we also know that the incidence of anxiety and depression and mental health concerns are really rising during this time. So it's really a time where we've been focusing a little bit more on complete well being, right? But we do have some other answers here. Only 5% uh, said number one, and then we had 31% on number three. Now, I may agree on uh, number two, but one of the things we think about is that none of these definitions is perfect. So the first one, the state of being free from illness or injury, when you think about that definition, it really is defined by medicine. In other words, you could be healthy today and diseased tomorrow based on whether or not the doctor tells you that you have a chronic illness. So what about if you go to the, the physician, your primary care doctor, and they miss a diagnosis? Are you healthy today and not healthy tomorrow? So that definition becomes a little bit murky when we think about it that way. And then the second definition, although most of us agree that that might be the closest one, 
we have to also think about the fact that it almost seems unattainable, right? Because if one aspect of this definition is missing, does it mean I'm unhealthy or incomplete? So for example, as we've been going through lockdowns, depending on where you are, we, we haven't been able to have as much face-to-face -face social interactions. Does that mean that we are not healthy? And it may or may not, it's just something for us to think about. And that third definition also has some flaws as well. It's Dr. Dean Ornish who defines health this way and specifically poor health. He says, poor health is not caused by something you don't have. It's caused by disturbing something that you already have. Health is not something you need to get. It's something you have already if you don't disturb it. Whether you agree with that definition or not, I think it's something to think about. What he's basically saying is that we all start at 100% and it's our job to sort of try to preserve the health that we have. Still an incomplete definition because it doesn't take into account healing. What if you have a disease and you get healed from it or cured from it and then aging? All of our health seems to decline as we age. There are just certain issues that pop up. So we're still in search of that perfect definition of health. However, most of us know that healthy eating is important now more than ever, and it is connected with overall health. So within this pandemic, about three quarters of Americans are saying that it's changing the way that they eat and prepare food. We have most Americans wanting to eat healthier in general. And when people are asked what healthy eating is, they typically say about uh, three attributes. So appropriate portion sizes, avoiding processed foods, and eating the right mix of different foods. But as nutrition professionals, as health professionals, what is it that actually helps people succeed in healthy eating? We're at the new year, so everyone's making New Year's resolutions, right? But how do we know they're actually going to stick with it? Typically by mid-February, we start to see folks falling off those resolutions. It was the Produce for Better Health Foundation. They did a plant-forward eating guide in 2021 where they looked at a meta-analysis of almost 300 interventions. And this intervention was designed to look at what motivates people to continue in their healthy eating behaviors. And what they found that is that it's not just what people know, right? And we, we sort of know this intuitively because we can give people nutrition education handouts and that'll be fine, but, and some people may take it, but not everyone will. The knowledge has to be combined with what people feel so their desires and their emotions, as well as what people do. And this has to do with routines, plans, impulses, trial and conversation. So in other words, healthy foods should be accessible in front of people so that it becomes a routine, it becomes a habit. And we also need to recognize the place that emotions and the way that people feel play into their motivation to eat healthier. I love these awkward weddy, uh, or Yeti uh, um, illustrations here, which always highlight the struggle between the brain and the heart. As you can see, the brain, that logical part of us is saying, hmm, not sure you wanna eat six scoops of ice cream right now if you wanna preserve your health. But the heart is just like, look, I don't care. I just want what I want right now. And don't we see that very much with our patients and even with ourselves sometimes? There's that struggle that we do contend with. So as professionals, we do need both the rational and emotional centers in our brains to make long lasting decisions, which is why we ask our patients many times, what is your why? So in other words, why do you have the health goals that you do? Because when it does get difficult, we need to be able to step back and say, this is why I'm motivated to make these changes. And our challenge is to ensure that we're educating patients on nutritious lifestyles and that we're also giving them rational and emotional tools and sensible tools to make the best decisions. And when I say emotional or sensible or, or rational tools, I'm talking about the fact that healthy foods should also be tasty and we wanna aim for habits rather than goals. So I think this is one of the places where we start to see that the Mediterranean diet really does have emphasis. Um, the benefits of the Mediterranean diet, we see that it's versatile, so a lot of foods tend to fit within this pattern. It also covers a major, a wide variety of food groups, all the major food groups, 
proteins, grains, fruits, and vegetables. It's low in saturated fat, which also supports heart and vascular health. And then it has some diverse flavors there. We know that global cuisine is really becoming popular now. And especially since we can't travel as much, being able to bring the Mediterranean diet into our homes, that's something that can be really attractive to our patients and to our consumers as well. Another thing with the Mediterranean diet is that we consider it to be a plant forward eating style. And what that means is that it doesn't necessarily avoid consumption of animal foods or, or uh, byproducts, but what it does is it puts plants at the center of the plate. So you have your fruits and vegetables and your nuts and your legumes being what's emphasized, and then you have healthy fats being emphasized as well. And what this does is that it makes it attainable for many patients and consumers. Now, as we've been talking about what helps people decide, we've been talking about these rational emotional centers in our brain. The interesting irony of all of this is that while our brains help us to decide which foods to eat, we need the emotional and the logical centers, we also need that from our food. So the foods in turn that we eat can help our brains decide and think and reason and process and feel. And this is one of the reasons why I think the Mediterranean style diet really shines forth because it helps us to achieve both of those aims. And for the Mediterranean diet, one of the things I like to say, when we think about the brain foods that are in the Mediterranean diet, so foods that help our brains flourish, the good thing to think about is in terms of additions, not subtractions. So if we focus on what we're adding in our diet, then we don't feel as deprived. And the truth of the matter is, as we add certain foods in our diet, then we have less space for other foods that may not be as nutritious, and we develop more of a palatability for the foods that are most nutritious. So I wanna touch on berries, dark green leafy vegetables, beans and legumes, and nuts, and talk about how those fit into the Mediterranean diet specifically for brain health. Blueberries, these are one of my favorites in the Mediterranean diet because we know that blueberries contain anthocyanins. This is what gives us it its blue color, the antioxidants there. And that helps to regulate free radical oxidative damage of the amyloid peptides that cause Alzheimer's disease. We know that when these peptides begin to sort of clump together because of oxidative stress, that this leads to kinds of dementias and Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot that we still don't know, but what we do know is that these antioxidants in blueberries can help to blunt some of that effect. The other interesting thing about blueberries is that it also improves glucoregulatory control through insulin sensitivity. Now you may have heard Alzheimer's disease being called type three diabetes because we're seeing that connection uh, through decreased cerebral blood flow in type two diabetics. Well, it's one of the reasons that maybe blueberries might work with improving cognition by being able to improve insulin sensitivity. And we've seen in previous studies that eating blueberries and berries in general is associated with improved memory, learning ability, and motor skills. The recommendation in a clinical setting is at least two to three times per week for patients. And it's also appropriate for type two diabetics, low glycemic fruit, um, we also have cardiovascular disease. The antioxidant capacity can help to reduce atherosclerosis disease. And then also end-stage renal disease. It's great for that as well because it's low in potassium, about 55 milligrams of potassium per half cup of blueberries. So it's really good for a lot of different diets that we may see. Green leafy vegetables. It's really hard to get folks to eat that, right? But kale is becoming a superfood. However, even if our patients don't have kale or our customers don't have kale, any green leafy vegetable will work. Uh, what we have here, lutein and zeaxanthins, these are beta carotenes, phyloquinones, that's our vitamin K, and folate can help to slow cognitive decline as we age as well. One of the mechanisms is that also, similar to what we see with the anthocyanins, they're able to work synergistically to help to reduce oxidative stress and neural inflammation that happens within the brain. 
I also like to think about green leafies as a double benefit when it comes on to clinical settings because that helps with our moms. We often hear pregnant women talking about the pregnancy brain and forgetting things here and there. And so including that in the diet, there's a double benefit for improving folate consumption for fetal development, as well as being able to potentially help with cognition of mom as well. Recommendation there, one to two servings per day. And then after that, one of the other foods I wanted to highlight was our beans and legumes. And specifically, I have fava beans here. So our beans and legumes are going to be rich in folate and other B vitamins. And all of these support proper function of our neurotransmitters. They also target neuroinflammation. And one of the things you may or may not know is that fava beans in the Mediterranean diet, they contain high levels of L-DOPA, which is an active ingredient in many Parkinson's right um, medications because we know that Parkinson's a lot of times it's because of the decreased levels of dopamine and L-dopa is a precursor for dopamine so being able to include that in the diet may be helpful for managing symptoms of Parkinson's like tremors stiffness and slowness of movement Recommendation here is one to two servings per day, but there is a caution um, just because fava beans, the amount of L-dopa is actually comparable to some of the medications. You do want to be mindful of what the patient's taken to uh, avoid unwanted effects. And then we'll switch over and talk a little bit more about nuts. Uh, nuts in the Mediterranean diet are also helpful for brain health and cognition uh, because the unsaturated fats and amino acids help to improve vascular function, and they also contain a host of antioxidants. Recommendation here, one to two servings per day as well. Now, I'm going to shift our conversation to talk about a less well-known nut in the Mediterranean diet, and these are peanuts. What we've been finding through research is that there are various compounds in peanuts that may also impact both cognitive and mental health. I want to share with you about a study that was done uh, in, at the University of Barcelona in Spain, and it was on the effect of peanut intake on brain health. The study was conducted between November 2020 and June 2021 in 63 healthy college students age 18 to 33. The key word healthy there is actually pretty significant because we know that when we're doing research, if you do it in healthy participants, it's harder to actually see an effect because people are healthy. So seeing an effect on health when your participants are already healthy, it's a little bit harder to do that. Um, so these were healthy participants. And then we also had measures of cognition and mental health taken at the beginning and the end. Microbiome changes were also measured there as well. So what the researchers did in this study was that they were three arms. So the first arm was peanut intake, and they had an ounce of peanuts per day. The second arm had peanut butter, or two tablespoons per day. And then there was a control butter that did not contain either of these two items. Some of the other items that were excluded just to make sure that we were seeing uh, the benefits of say the polyphenols in the uh, peanuts and peanut butter, they could not eat uh, chocolate uh, or red grapes or even red wine or other nuts were excluded in the project as well. Fecal samples were taken from microbiome as well as blood samples, as well as survey questions for the cognitive and mental health measures. The main findings in this study uh, very significant and very exciting. So the main uh, findings were that they saw that when participants consumed either peanuts or peanut butter, there was an improvement in overall memory. And that included delayed memory as well as verbal and nonverbal memory. There was also uh, an improvement in depression scores. So the entire cohort saw lower depression scores and then peanuts and peanut butter saw lower anxiety scores. And then we also saw lower cortisol levels with the inclusion of peanuts and peanut butter in the diet. That's significant because it wasn't just the participants saying, hey, I don't feel stressed after eating peanuts or peanut butter. We know that cortisol is that stress hormone that's indicative of stress. Um, but what we were able to see was the actual biochemical measurements as we measured that in the urinary uh, cortisol there. So that was really significant in this study. 
Why is it that we saw the benefits that we did? Well, there are a few theories here. Uh, we know from previous research that healthy fats tend to make up our membranes and that unsaturated fats may make our membranes more fluid. Certain saturated fats may stiffen the membrane and may make them not function as well. We know that peanuts contain a host of unsaturated fats. Now with the saturated fat and, and making the membrane stiffer, uh, there's a study that was done, earlier study in 2008, that showed that rats were fed either uh, saturated fat content from coconut oil or an unsaturated fat from soybean oil for eight weeks. The sat fat treated rats committed more working memory errors and they had more inflammation in the brain. And there was also an impairment in the structure of the hippocampus as well. So from this study, uh, seeing that the type of saturated fat had a lot to do with how uh, the cognitive benefits were seen in the rats. So we know that that makes a difference However, in this study, we also saw that there were very long chain saturated fatty acids that actually had positive benefits on cognition. This is emerging research that has been showing that very long chain fatty acids, I'm talking uh, those that have bonds, uh, 20 carbons, 22 carbons, 24. More than 20 is what we usually think of as the very long chain sat fats. And these play a major role in terms of cell signaling and decreasing inflammation, not only within the cell membrane, but also within the myelin sheath as well. And we have seen in previous research from Harvard University that these very long chain sat fats were able to uh, decrease blood lipids and reduce risk for cardiovascular disease, as well as has reduced risk for type 2 diabetes. Now, it's interesting to know, it's important to note that this is not a lot in peanuts. And so the source and function of these sat fats may be important with the benefits that we're seeing here. We also know that peanuts are really high in the amino acid arginine, which helps to dilate blood vessels and improve blood flow. That helps with improvement of nutrients and antioxidants to fight off inflammation. And so that may also improve cognition. And then what this research also found, they were able to, to look at a specific polyphenol called P-cumeric acid. And there was research done a few years back that showed that this particular polyphenol, P-cumeric acid. It's actually a precursor to resveratrol that we see in wine and red grapes. This is able to activate GABA, which is a neurotransmitter in the brain that regulates mood and decreases anxiety. And in fact, in this study, the researchers were thinking that picumeric acid may actually be a safe and effective alternative for helping to reduce stress and anxiety. In fact, it was comparable to the leading depression med medications that's used in clinical settings. So here's another study um, that was done in 2000, in 2021. And so we may be asking ourselves the question, does this work just in younger participants? But what we saw from this study was that we also see similar benefits of peanut and peanut butter consumption in older patients as well. So this study uh, showed that older adults who did not regularly consume peanuts or peanut butter were up to 71% more likely to do poorly on cognitive tests than those who did. So there was that association that was seen in this study that was published earlier last year. Uh, this one does have some uh, limitations because it's cross-sectional in nature. So more studies are needed to determine causality, specifically in older adults. But the ones that we saw from the University of Barcelona, these were very strong results that we see, particularly in younger, healthy individuals. But for this study that I mentioned with older individuals, it's also really important when we think about longevity and the brain. As we see this cartoon here, uh, you know, we hear this a lot. Uh, there are three signs of old age. The first is memory loss, and I forget the other two. Because we know that as we age, our risk for developing brain-related diseases actually increases. We know that Alzheimer's disease is in the top 10 diseases. However, it's the only one that cannot be cured. A lot of people uh, say that that's the one that cannot be cured. And one of the reasons for this is because of the high failure rate that we see with Alzheimer's drug development. We have about a 99.6% failure rate within a 10, per, uh, 10 year period from 2002 to 2012. And I'll tell you that it doesn't look that different even today. 10 years later. 
Currently, the success rate continues to remain low. So we really do have to function on primary prevention. And doing that would mean focusing on the foods that we eat. And we don't just want to start as we're getting older, we're all going to get older, but as early as possible throughout our lives, we're seeing that the benefits can follow us throughout our lives to help to help us with health, healthy aging and healthy brain development as we age. Just a look here at the normal brain compared to an Alzheimer's brain. What we see in the normal brain, uh, we see that cerebral cortex there, which is involved in thinking and planning and remembering. The hippocampus, which is primarily involved in new memories, short-term and long-term memory. And then the entorhinal cortex that relays messages to and from the hippocampus. It's very evident as we look at Alzheimer's disease and the brain shrinkage that happens there, there's extreme shrinkage of the cerebral cortex, severely enlarged ventricles, extreme shrinkage of the hippocampus. And there's no doubt that that structural change has a lot to do with the functionality that we see in the brain. So again, really important that we target these cognitive measures and as much as possible with prevention rather than waiting until it's too late. And many of you have heard about the, the MIND diet. This is uh, a dietary pattern that was developed from Rush University and Harvard University. And it takes components of both the Mediterranean diet and DASH diet and uh, takes those foods that are considered to be brain foods. So the ones that we talked about before, berries, leafy greens, nuts, peanuts, as well as legumes, and it puts them together in a very uh, systematic way in this dietary pattern. And what we saw in a 2015 study was that this particular combination for fighting cognitive decline was associated with a 53% lower risk of Alzheimer's disease. And specifically, both peanuts and peanut butter are being included in that dietary pattern were excellent sources of niacin and vitamin D, vitamin E, sorry, which were found to lower risk of Alzheimer's disease by 70%. It's one of the reasons why Dr. Frank Sachs from Harvard University said that peanuts and peanut butter were included in the MIND diet study. And one of the reasons was that we see so many years of research that peanut and peanut butter consumption is good for cardiovascular health. And so this was why they said we thought that peanuts could be an important component in that diet to help to prevent cognitive decline. And we see the benefits there all across the lifespan. So as I wrap up, I just want to remind us of this. Small changes make a big difference in preserving health. Again, we're at the new year, people are making resolutions. Sometimes people make lofty resolutions. And that's one of the reasons why they don't work as well, right? Because we may think too grand, but small steps can help us get to the goals that we want to get to. And so those four components that I talk, talked about, the leafy greens, a cup a day, your beans and legumes, a cup a day, berries, a cup a day, look at peanuts, just a handful a day, okay? Just a handful a day one ounce each day, and you're able to reap uh, some significant benefits based on the research and being able to apply it to a variety of patients, a variety of situations that we may come across. Easy, accessible, and tasty. I would like to, as I uh, transition here, just invite you to check out our website. We do have a research library on the Peanut Institute's website, which is www.peanutinstitute.com. You can search a variety of, uh, of uh, topics such as cognition or cardiovascular health, type 2 diabetes, fitness. We have a ton of studies on there that you can look at and kind of see how peanuts affect human health. And at this time, I'm happy to pass it over to Amber and Brandon. I'm really excited about this portion of the webinar because we learn how to cook great food. And it's, it's great for us to learn what the foods do, but it's even better for us to learn how to actually make them in our homes. So here's Amber's bio. She's a registered dietitian and she's an award-winning nutrition educator, personal chef and podcaster based in Lincoln, Nebraska. As a culinary dietitian and recipe developer, Amber shares her love for food and food photography at Sterlist.com and is the host of Healthy Under Pressure, a podcast for busy professionals. Most recently, Amber has joined the staff at Great Plains Culinary Institute at Southeast Community College and is also a local radio and television personality. 
She was named the 2021 Outstanding Dietitian of the Year from the Nebraska Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics and was named one of the 10 dietitians to follow on social media, so make sure you follow her, by US News and World Report. And then we also have Brandon Harpster. He is chef instructor for the Great Plains Culinary Institute at Southeast Community College and managing partner, corporate chef, for all the single barrel restaurant concepts. As a chef and self-taught butcher who has spent his entire career in the hospitality industry, Brandon is credentialed through the American Culinary Foundation as a certified executive chef. He was awarded Chef of the Year in 2013 by Nebraska Restaurant Association and has been included in the Best Chefs America since 2013. I'm happy to pass it over to Amber and Brandon right now. All right, uh, I am going to play um, this video that Amber and Brandon were kind enough to share with us. And um, as a treat, we do have Amber with us live today. Um, so she'll be able to answer your questions during the Q&A. Hi, everyone. My name is Amber Pankinen. I'm a registered dietitian and personal chef at Sterlis.com. And today I am joined by Brandon Harpster, who is a certified executive chef and also a chef instructor uh, with myself at Great Plains Culinary Institute in Lincoln, Nebraska. But today we are in my home kitchen, which is far away from the Mediterranean, uh, but hopefully we can bring the Mediterranean flavors into the kitchen today and inspire you to cook some Mediterranean meals and to be able to talk to your clients and patients about the recipes that we are sharing today. So the first thing is really talking about why we love peanuts, right? So early on in, I would say, our friendship, sure. we discovered that we both have a love for peanuts. I think that was when you raided my stash. Yeah, I found it pretty quickly. <laughs> so I have a peanut stash at work, which has peanuts and peanut butter. This guy helped himself. <laughs> I know a number of our chefs definitely love peanuts as well, and they help themselves too. Uh, but we love peanuts and for a variety of reasons. So as a dietitian, you know, nutrition is definitely something that is top of mind for me. Peanuts have seven grams of plant-based protein, 19 vitamins and minerals, and two grams of fiber per serving, which again, I love recommending peanuts uh, to my students and my clients, again, because they're so nutritious. Next would be affordability, mm -hmm. right? So definitely. peanuts are so affordable and I know at one of Brandon's restaurants, uh, you've got a an item that I absolutely love okay, that you. has peanut butter in yep. it. Uh, tell me, why do you keep peanuts on the menu? Uh, we like the flavor. Uh, it's it's really comes down to uh, the flavor that we use, and we we enjoy it, and we think it just it's very complimentary to some of the things that we're doing in the restaurant already. So right. So again, affordability, and then also flavor, and then of course uh, accessibility and variety. Mm -hmm. Right, so today we're going to be utilizing a variety of peanut products, including peanut butter, which is my personal favorite, peanuts, and then peanut oil. Yep. Uh, so a variety of options to choose from. So for our menu today, you know, we have already prepared a peanut hummus, um, but we have a Greek salad. We'll teach you how to make a very simple peanut oil vinaigrette with that. We've got a peanut pesto that's going to be served over shrimp and polenta. And then finally, a peanut butter tart. So let's talk real briefly about the hummus okay. that we've already prepared today. Uh, and we went ahead and prepared this ahead of time just so that you could you could see the hummus, but also it has a unique spin on it. Mm -hmm. So this hummus is like a standard hummus. Uh, a lot of the same ingredients, chickpeas, lemon juice, uh, some tahini, which is the sesame paste that's commonly in hummus that gives it a lot of its flavor. Uh, but we also added peanut butter to it. Mm -hmm. And I like the peanut butter in there. I love peanut butter. The flavor <laughs> is delicious. Uh, and so it adds a little bit of a unique flavor to it, but then it also helps with the texture of it and gives it just that kind of that, that, that richness to it um, without having to really add a lot of rich ingredients mm -hmm. to it. And I think it, I think it turns out great. Right. And you know, hummus can be used as a spread or a dip. Uh, I love it because it encourages people to eat vegetables, mm -hmm. right? So again, we have a variety of veggies here. You could also serve that with some pita bread. So it just makes a great snack or appetizer for yeah, your friends definitely. and family. And it, the thing I like about a hummus like this too, is it can all be done ahead of time. Absolutely. And when your guests show up, you can just bring that right out. 
Um, that's one of the reasons why we like serving it in our catering department and our restaurants, things along, along those lines. Yeah, I love that. Okay, Brandon, let's talk about vinaigrettes. Okay. Do we also need to get the shrimp yes, started? Yes, we do. Yes, we okay. do. So, I'll ahead. let you go ahead and, and get that going. I'm going to move right. this out of the way. And then we will get our Greek salad as well. All right. And then we're going to stir up some vinaigrette because okay. this is going to be delicious. Here's our Greek salad. Thank you. There you go. All right. So we were having this debate about what is best when it comes to preparing your vinaigrette. Yep. yep. Right. So I know from a personal chef perspective, I've always utilized a mason jar. I know this is something my clients will keep in their refrigerator. I'll mm -hmm. mix it up at the beginning of the week and they can utilize this throughout the week. However, this guy over here only wants to utilize a oh, whisk. Whisk in a bowl, <laughs> whisk in a bowl. So for vinaigrettes, right? Let's, let's talk about the ratio for a simple vinaigrette. Okay, so for a simple vinaigrette, it's three to one. Uh, it's three parts oil to one part. And I don't like to say vinegar, um, but it's acid. Acid. Uh, mm -hmm. Really key, because like we're utilizing lemon juice today. Right. Instead of vinegar, just for the flavor purposes of it. Uh, right. I like, I like a simple vinaigrette uh, with lemon in it. I think it's very fresh tasting uh, and it works really well. And we're going to utilize peanut oil for mm -hmm. this, um, which I love because peanut oil, again, super nutritious, great source of vitamin E, which is an antioxidant, um, but also very high in monounsaturated fats. So that's similar to olive oil. The other thing I love about peanut oil is that it has a very mild flavor. Yep. And the smell is also very mild too, where again, I love olive oil, but mm -hmm. if you're comparing, right, again, in terms of flavor and maybe smell and then cost, yep, definitely. right? So peanut oil is very affordable, which is something too, I think is important to pass along to your clients. So let's have a little, uh, a little vinaigrette, off, a little vinaigrette okay. off. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. So um, why don't you go ahead and give us some, the, some, some ingredients, some ingredients okay. in here. Tell us All what right. we're doing. So very simply, we're just going to put just a little bit of garlic in there um, in each. We'll put a little bit of mine and a little bit in the mason okay. jar. And then we're going to put, um, I like to use Dijon mustard in it. Uh, I find Dijon is uh, very good. It helps bind the dressing a little mm -hmm. bit so that it doesn't separate so easily. And then also the other thing that it really does is it, again, it gives it that unique flavor, right. um, which I love Dijon mustard. Uh, and some for creaminess this. too. Yep, I mean, it helps with that. You don't necessarily have to add the Dijon no, mustard, no, not at but all. it does not make it good. And then we're going to add our lemon juice. Just got a fresh lemon here, and we're just going right. to squeeze okay. a half into each one. I want to squeeze lemon juice in your face, chef. Thank you. Thank you for not doing that. <laughs> we appreciate it. I tried not to do this. I tried That's to right. return the favor here. That's right. So now we're getting to the point where for Amber's, oh, we, got, we have we to have put a the little, salt and pepper in there too. Pepper. So this is the other thing too that I like with making your own salad dressing is that you can control the mm -hmm. amount of salt that you're putting in. You know, when we buy dressings that are already prepared at the grocery store, they're often very high in sodium and other fats. Yep, and exactly. So this way we can control what's going in there. Yeah. And before we start that real quickly, I'm going to get the shrimp on. Okay. Um, so we have some shrimp that is um, just marinated. We just have some marinated shrimp here that's just easily marinated in a little bit of peanut oil, some uh, lemon juice as well, and then some fresh dill. Uh, and we're going to put that right on our grill. And we have this grill pan here. It smells it's really ready good. to go. Again, I keep this, this is very fresh, easy way to cook the shrimp. So we're going to let that go and we'll give you those. Okay. We'll just put this over here. I right. wish they could smell this because that it smells, smells great. so really good. The, the flavor of that, the aroma of that dill. Yeah. And then the, then the lemon from it as well. So I'm also okay. going to add some mint here to both these. And this is just some fresh chopped mint. I love mint in salads Perfect. Uh, because I, it just really adds that freshness to it. And I put a little bit in the salad as well. We need a little oil. We need oil. oil. We need so, oil. For yours, I'm just going to put the oil in. <laughs> so again, in. he's eyeballing this, but mm -hmm. three to one ratio is, yep. is really what you're going for. You but can, sometimes I like a little more acid. Yep, and, and that's the thing, the beauty about making it yourself is yeah. you can you can make that decision. You don't have to let um, right. it already be kind of predetermined for you. So, okay. Right. So moment of truth yep. there. So okay. I stir with a whisk. 
Put my lid on. Amber gets her lid on. All right. And then I start adding my oil and I stir as I go. He's, he gets real fancy with it. Real fancy. But a whisk though, a whisk is a very simple tool that everybody has. Everyone needs to have. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh no, chef. Mine's looking. Yours is looking, looking really good. Is it looking good? Too? Let's let's switch angles here and I think let's mine's show looking them. Pretty good too. I think mine looks better. Uh, I don't know about that. But... <laughs> I like it. And it smells so good. Yeah. Yeah. It does. All right. So mine smells Perfect. good. And then the only thing you could do, like I said, I usually recommend if we're doing this, a little less oil, and then add a little bit more. Um, to start if you need to, or if you like that. The, the flavor that it's at with the it amount tastes. of it, the acidity. I don't know, mine tastes pretty darn good. So does mine. I like it. And right. I love that peanut oil in it, again, because it's just such a mild flavor. Yep, exactly, exactly. And that's that's one of the, the great things about it is it doesn't, it allows the flavor of the mint, the Dijon, and all those things to kind of mm -hmm. come through um, on its own. And then we can just easily pour this over our salad or serve it on the side and the people add it as they want to. I love it. Okay, let's talk pesto. All right, pesto. Pesto's fun. <laughs> we'll switch this out real quick. So traditional pesto, Brandon, I know you and I were talking about this earlier, mm -hmm. you know, utilizes pine nuts yes. uh, and basil, of course, but pine nuts right now are one, you know, fairly expensive. And, yeah. you know, because of the supply chain issues, we're also seeing maybe a delay in getting that and, product. And just accessibility, accessibility. Right. For sure. Right. So with this uh, peanut pesto, you know, we're, we're utilizing peanuts, uh, which is going to provide that texture at mm -hmm. a much cheaper cost, I think, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to start off. We're just going to add, uh, making a pesto is very, very simple. Uh, it's really, for the most part, we're just going to be adding all of our um, basil in there. We're going to add our nuts, our Parmesan some salt, and then also our garlic ahead of time. So we have all those ingredients in there, and then this is where we're gonna emulsify it. So we're gonna put the lid on. That's a fancy word for meaning it's all Mix coming it together. Yep. yep, there you go. So I'm gonna just turn the mixer on here, or the blender on real quick here, and just kind of let it start to work and chop those things up ahead of time, or before I start adding any of the oil. And that's a good step, right? In yep. order to just, yeah, because it kind of just pre-chops everything a little yeah. bit so that you don't have that 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 issue of it not quite getting smooth enough. And then with it running, we're just going to start to add in slowly our oil. And I always love the smell of yes. pesto when you're making it. Um, you're getting all those oils from, from the basil and all of those things, and it just smells great. Very fresh smelling. Okay, so then I am going to real quickly just kind of tap it down a little bit to get all my, my ingredients kind of pushed back down there as they kind of kicked up onto the side. I'll blend it just for another second and then we'll be good to go. Smells really good too. Definitely. And the, the flavor of this, I think, pairs really nicely with the shrimp mm -hmm, that which I need to turn. we're grilling right now. So we have our shrimp, and um, so I'm just going to give those a quick turn. Again, all of this fits in the Mediterranean diet. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and blend this just a little bit more. Great. What do you think? A little more oil? Yeah, let's have a little more oil. A little more. All right. Well, let's see. Go ahead and do that. And this could be served over any protein or, you know, as a, a sauce, right? Mm -hmm. with, with other things. Well, basically, anything that you would serve pesto with, you could serve this peanut pesto. Yeah, okay. That's right, looking so really good. Really, really yeah, good. the texture's coming together. Definitely. All right, we're good? good? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Let me get this out of the way. Okay. Thank you. And then I think our plate, I'm going to walk around you. Okay. Chef, and grab our plate for our shrimp. For our shrimp. So on the base of this, Brandon, let's talk about what we have on the bottom. Okay. Which is? Polenta. Polenta. Yes. Yeah. And I'm going to grab the polenta. We have that already made. But it's very easy to make, and it fits. I think it go. I think it pairs great with our. Mm -hmm. um, and it fits within the Mediterranean diet as well. So, uh, 
polenta has been around for a very long mm -hmm. time and we wanted to use polenta because we're embracing our Nebraska roots. Yes, definitely. It's always a great way to have corn on your menu <laughs> year round without having to, you know, when corn's not in season. Mm -hmm. So okay. we'll just take this and um, we're serving our polenta creamy today. Uh, you can also chill it ahead of time and it firms up and then people will cut it into whichever shape they want to and kind of give it a sear. And so I'm just going to put the plant it kind of on the plate as a base. You know, a lot of times people will say, you know, a lot of times the American version of polenta is grits. And so I always have, mm -hmm. I try to, try to always really have one or the other on my menus at all, at all times, the polenta or the, or, or a grit. And so, yeah, the, the pesto looks great. I'm going to check our shrimp real quick here to see if there's Are there done. any uh, plating tips or thoughts, recommendations on polenta on the plate? I usually always try to try to get it into the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing with it is I always like to see the plant to hit the plate and it's going to relax and kind of just have sure. that natural kind of that natural form that it does. Right. So our shrimp are good to go. They look, they look absolutely delicious. delicious. So we're just going to put those um, right on the plate here. And I like to, when I plate something like this, I always try to get it so that I have the shrimp um, up. So mm -hmm. just so I always kind of elevate it up off the plate a little bit kind of a chef trick it looks makes it look like there's a it's a little more it's kind of coming at you right and then we're right. just going to spoon our pesto right over the top and brandon and right let's talk shrimp. about shrimp very quickly because okay. i know shrimp also fits within the mediterranean diet uh but you know when it comes to purchasing shrimp what should people keep in mind uh keep in mind you want to obviously you want them to look nice you want them to look fresh um, I like to buy and recommend for people to buy the easy peel shrimp. Uh, that means they've already been uh, deveined. Uh, they, the shell's already split. So it's very easy to, to peel. You could leave those with the peel on if you wanted to, um, or you could take those with, you could take that peel off very easily because it already has that split in the back. So I really prefer the easy peel shrimp. Um, and for grueling like this, I like to buy bigger shrimp because okay. I just think they, they kind of hold their, their stability a little more. I'm going to finish this with just a little bit of, uh, peanut oil over the top just kind of give that plate mm -hmm. um, a little more moisture on it and then we're going to finish this and top it with some micro arugula which i like the freshness <laughs> of the arugula i like the the flavor of it as well it has just that little bit of um, spiciness to it that mm -hmm. i really like that kind of pairs well with the shrimp um uh, and the pesto and all our other flavors on there. So and we're getting our... some extra nutrition in here too. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> it, adds, it adds that freshness to it, um, and it makes it it gives, makes it look really nice and fresh. That looks really good. Thank I'm you. excited about this. Yeah, me too. Me okay. too. It's great. It's a great dish, um, and you could adjust the portioning on it a little bit too if you wanted to serve make that to serve uh, a few people. You could do a bigger platter with multiple skewers sure. on it, or you could do it. Um, you could cut it, you know, cut it back a little bit and put a little less polenta on there or anything, like, or anything along those lines. Okay. Well, and then finally, we have to have dessert. Definitely. <laughs> so let's talk about this no bake peanut butter tart. And I think on this angle, oh yeah, you can still see us here. So this is super easy. And again, Mediterranean inspired. The crust contains dates, peanuts, uh, a little bit of cocoa powder mm -hmm. uh, and just a tiny bit of brown sugar. So you're going to use a food processor, blend that up, um, maybe add just a little bit of water for moisture. That's your crust. So you can go ahead and fit that into your pie pan, stick it in the refrigerator until that hardens, and then we can make our filling. Okay. So Brandon, if you want to grab the um, yeah. stuff for our filling, we'll go ahead and add that in. Okay. So the filling is really simple. Um, we're going to be utilizing, again, just a little bit of brown sugar. Okay. We've got just a tiny bit of butter and then cream cheese. We're going to utilize some Greek yogurt. And then, of course, peanut butter. Of so course. I'll let you go ahead and get that peanut okay. butter out for me. I'll add the Greek yogurt. We'll switch angles here too so that everyone can see what's going in our mixture. Sure. Yes, looks so good. This is one of my favorite things to eat. I'm looking forward, <laughs> I am looking forward to eating this. And again, uh, 
Brent and I will be the first to say, even though we cook quite a bit, we love very simple recipes. Yep, very much so. Yeah. So the key, I think, with this is making sure that the ingredients are at room okay. temperature. And you want to add your vanilla? Yeah, go ahead and add that vanilla. All right. Good catch. Thank you. So it just makes it easier to blend together when it's at room temperature, yep. which is what I love. Okay. So this is coming together really nicely. It only takes maybe like a minute, maybe a minute and a half to get everything blended. So we'll just show everyone what this looks like. Uh, so this is the filling for the tart. And Brandon, if you want to grab that crust yep. that's back behind you, we'll just show everyone what that looks like. Uh, so here's our crust. And all you're going to do is fill this with the peanut butter mixture. I'll just grab this off here. Brandon, I'm going to hand that to you. Yeah, to okay. <laughs> don't lick the, don't lick the <laughs> paddle. Okay. So you're going to just spread this inside and you could even use an icing spatula if you wanted to, to get a nice smooth texture on that. But for sake of time, we'll just show you what this will look like. I'll hand that to you. Right. And so you'll just spread this in your pie crust. And then um, what I did with the one that you see here is um, I put this in the refrigerator again for an hour, and then you can decorate this with fruits. So I know Dr. Sterling talked about the importance of berries in the Mediterranean diet. So of course you could utilize fruit on the top with some additional chopped peanuts. Looks delicious. Really, really yep. easy dessert. Okay. All right. So we hope you enjoyed the recipes we shared today. It was a pleasure being with you and we're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Amber, uh, for that wonderful cooking demonstration. I'm so excited uh, to have you both here. Um, as a reminder, um, we do have a little bit of time for some question and answer. So be typing those into the Q&A box. Um, and I guess we'll get started. Um, Dr. Sterling, we had a couple of questions about the new research that you introduced about peanuts and um, uh, brain health and mental health. Um, so we had a couple of specific questions. Um, you mentioned uh, the control group using a control butter do you know what was in that <laughs> or yeah so that that control butter was actually peanut oil and the reason that was done we actually did see benefits with the peanut oil um it wasn't just peanut oil it was also uh some other unsaturated fats in there because we wanted to be able to tease out the benefits of the oil from the peanuts as well as be able to see what the benefits may have been for some other unsaturated fats so for example that's one of the reasons we saw that the depression scores in improved with the peanut oil, peanuts, and peanut butter as well. So we were able to see, for example, what the fats were doing as well as what the polyphenols were doing as well. So that's what the control butter was. Hope that helps. And then I just have, uh, we just had a couple of follow-up questions about the study as well. For the peanut butter that was used, do you know if it was like a commercial type of peanut butter that might have some additional oils or was it more of a natural style with just peanuts? Okay, so, and that depends on the study. So this particular mm. study did use natural peanut butter, but I will say that, and again, these were sensitive markers that we were looking at in healthy folks. But the other study that I mentioned that was done here in the US, the cross-sectional, that one was just regular peanut butter. And we also, there was actually another study that was done in Australia a few years ago that I didn't get a chance to talk about. And that one was also regular peanut butter, seeing effects, beneficial effects for short-term memory. I think one of the, the reasons we see similarities between say natural and commercial peanut butter is because commercial peanut butter is really about 90% peanuts anyway. So um, we really kind of think of that as a matter of preference or choice, whatever people prefer, they can do. And I saw uh, a lot of comments in the chat about healthy food being accessible and affordable. 
completely agree with that. And so if you have patients who want to know if they can get the benefit from just regular peanut butter that they can pick up in the store that may not that may fit their price point or their budget, you can feel comfortable being able to recommend that to them um, and being able to get the benefits from that too. That's great. And I would like to keep going on that topic. Um, Amber, I was wondering if you could share tips for, you know, patients or clients who are interested in a Mediterranean diet, but may be working with either a limited budget or just limited accessibility to foods. Right. You know, I think, you know, examples that we shared here today, especially utilizing peanuts in the diet, you know, that's a great entry into the Mediterranean diet. And then I know that there was some comments in the chat about, you know, can we use frozen fruits and vegetables? Absolutely. <laughs> you know, that's a great way, again, to incorporate those foods, you know, at a price point that is accessible for a lot of people. That's great. Thank you. Um, we also had um, a few other questions as well about the, oh gosh, I, um, we had a few questions um, about the, um, the amount, um, you mentioned one ounce as, as a serving size, could you clarify um, what that might look like to someone? Right. Um, thanks for asking that question, for bringing that up. So one ounce, ounce is literally a handful. So, And we've actually had a study show that recommending just a handful to your patients, it actually works out to be about 30 grams that they'll consume, which is about an ounce or serving. So just say one handful. It's easy for people to recognize that. If you prefer a quarter cup, that's okay too, but handful works. Okay, great. Um, there's a lot of questions and comments about powdered peanuts or um, powdered peanut butter. Um, yeah. So I guess, first of all, from a nutritional perspective, would do they have the same makeup as peanuts or what's, what's different there? So what we see is that there is uh, there's a difference. Now, they're all healthy in different ways. So for example, we, uh, there was a study on uh, powdered peanut butter in athletes and being able to improve muscle quality and muscle growth. We see that with peanut powder. Uh, what we see with peanut powder is that it's higher in protein. Um, and then we also have uh, it's defatted, so you don't have the fats there. So if you have specific situations where someone may not necessarily would prefer to have the powdered peanut butter to get a bit more protein, because there isn't as much fat um, in the servings, you'll get more protein in there if you're wanting to build muscle. For cognition, though, remember from the study, the, the fatty acids were actually one of the, the factors that helped with cognition. So it depends on what you're using it for. And we see that the variety of peanut products help with various things. So peanut powder, I would say for fitness, um, you can use peanuts for a lot of things and peanut butter as well. Type 2 diabetes, especially for peanut butter, is a good one. We were brainstorming oh, yeah. actually about the powdered peanut butter and how I know Brandon wants to add that to polenta <laughs> and maybe put that on a menu. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. Um, we had some interesting questions about brain health in general um, that we were hoping you could answer, Dr. Sterling. Um, so at, towards the beginning of your presentation, you talk about some different plant-based foods and um, they're, they're um, for reducing kind of that pregnant brain fog that you mentioned. Um, do you know if the, these also impact the microbiome and hormones to contribute to these improvements? Yeah, so I think that's still a relatively new area of research, uh, but I will say that the components that we find in plant foods like peanuts, as well as the green leafies that we talked about. The folate we know are good for, is good for menopausal symptoms, hot flashes. We see research on folate and being able to reduce uh, menopausal symptoms. 
And but what we see with the folate, though, is that it really has a lot to do with deficiency. So if folks aren't meeting the RDA, that's where you may start to see the menopause fog or you may start to see the hot flashes. So we're not sure if adding more than the RDA or adding more folate to the diet may improve cognition or if preventing deficiency would uh, would mean just making sure that you are getting enough folate in your diet. So more to come on that. Great. Amber, um, your, some of your recipes in today included peanut oil. Um, and in the chat, it sounds like that's a new ingredient for some people. Um, so do you have some tips about maybe what types of recipes might be well suited for peanut oil or also tips about, you know, what to look for in the store? Like, are there certain cues on the label or? Sure. So I think, you know, what you saw today, we utilized it in a number of dishes, including the marinade for our shrimp. So feel free to use that when you're making a marinade. You know, when it comes to selecting peanut oil in the store, we use the store brand. And I think that's something to be said, especially when it comes to your clients and your patients, you want them to be able to afford, you know, it's something that is accessible to them. And so that store brand is a good one to look for. Thank you so much. And I guess probably good for affordability as well. Absolutely. Um, I think that's about all the questions we have time for today. Um, just a reminder, we will send you these slides and we'll send you this recording. Um, so keep an eye out in your email within one week. And we'll also send the CPU certificate for dietitians. And then you can also um, find, we shared a link um, to the recipes, but we'll also share that link again in our follow-up email so you can make these delicious recipes at home. So thank you so much, Dr. Sterling and Amber and to the Peanut Institute. It's, it's been a pleasure.